welcome everyone. I look forward to presenting uh, the topic today. Is it time to look for a new uh, accounting system? My background is I'm a partner here at iBailey. I have about uh, 25 years of experience in technology consulting practices. I've also uh, worked in public accounting for 10 plus years primarily on the audit side of the practice. Um, however, I've been working with ERP systems for, for approximately 25 years. I'm certified in six different ERP applications and I focus on helping people select the right ERP system for their business and for their needs. So we're gonna talk a little bit today about uh, some of those topics. Our agenda will include the following. Uh, first, what we'd like to do is talk about uh, how to evaluate your technology as a whole and some of the criteria that you should use to determine whether or not you have a potential issue with your technology and might want to uh, look at making a change. We'll also talk about specifically business systems and ERP systems and how you can evaluate those. And some of those criteria are similar and there are some, some differences as well, some more specific criteria specific to uh, accounting applications. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the difference between cloud and traditional uh, legacy ERP software, um, and then identify what are some of the challenges that businesses face when they're using legacy technology and how that can impact your growth and the flexibility within your company. And then we're going to talk about uh, how cloud ERP has essentially changed the game. And what are some of the benefits of cloud ERP for a growing business? How can you leverage those uh, and how can they benefit you? long term. And then also, um, once you've determined that it's the right time to look for a new ERP system, what are some of the criteria you should use when you're evaluating those at a high level? And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what that evaluation process looks like and some of the specific things that you should be thinking about as you're going into those evaluations. To get started here, let's talk about technology as a whole. So what should we be considering when we are evaluating our technology solutions? And this could be a number of different uh, products or infrastructure elements or iPads solutions that are in your environment. You can apply these criteria to evaluating all of those types of systems. And the first one I wanna talk about is reliability. Reliability is the concept of having a system that delivers accurate results. And I think we can all um, relate to some personal experiences of having a scenario where we may run one report out of a particular application and then we run a similar report, perhaps let's say over sales, and they don't agree, right? And so we're, we're struggling to understand what is real, what is accurate. Uh, so what, what we want to have when we're looking at any system is something that's reliable, that we can trust to make informed management decisions. The next criteria that uh, I recommend you consider is integrity. And this really means, does the system typically function error-free? Right? Can, can we have confidence that we're going to be able to perform our daily tasks in the application or are we constantly addressing bugs or challenges or data integrity issues that are causing us to have to either restore from backup or correct data at the table level within the application? So integrity is an important criteria of any application that you're running. Um, probably the one that causes the most people to come to us though is, is honestly performance. And as your business grows, as your volume of transactions increases, as the amount of data that you're storing increases, uh, you may find that you're having uh, performance issues either inside of your application or in your infrastructure in general. So this can mean, does, does the system respond in acceptable time within the user interface? So as you are trying to navigate the application, enter data, save data, uh, is, it, uh, is there a time lag when it's presenting screens, when it's generating reports? Uh, reporting will often be the first time you see, the first place that you see performance issues because if you have a large volume of data and the system is not optimized for that, it really can have difficult uh, rendering that data on screen on a timely basis. Also, you may have scheduled events that are running behind the scenes. Perhaps there's no user interaction with them, but we're importing large volumes of data or we're processing transactions in batch. Think of like your MRP runs, things like that if you're a manufacturing company. Uh, if those are taking an extraordinary amount of time, uh, that can be indicative of a system problem. Availability is another criteria that you might look at as you're evaluating your technology systems. First of all, is the system accessible when needed? What does the uptime look like? How much of your 
uh, time and energy is spent just making sure the system is available to users when they want to use it. Uh, availability can also extend to the concept of uh, being able to access it from multiple locations, especially now as we're going into this uh, or living through this COVID experience, how easy is it to get to your systems from remote locations and or mobile devices? And then finally, I think you wanna think about flexibility and this can also apply to scalability. So how adaptable is the system to a new, uh, new changes in your business operating environment? What kind of hoops do you have to jump through just to make sure that it is available and accessible to users outside of your local network environment? Um, how extensible is the product? How easy is it to add additional modules to it? Is there healthy community of ISV solutions around it? And ISV stands for uh, Independent Software Vendor. So anytime you see an acronym here, I will try to define that acronym just for anybody who's not familiar with terminology. Uh, so these are all things that you can look at for a system as a whole. Um, so when we're talking specifically about accounting applications, there are some additional criteria you might want to consider, and there's some similarities between what we learned about in general technology and what we're going to talk about with specifically accounting or business systems. Uh, but I do want to go through these in a little bit of detail for you. So the first thing I think to think about when you're looking at a specific application is what does the publisher support of that application look like? And you might not really have visibility into how much investment your publisher is putting into the specific business application, but you can ask questions around that. And it's good to understand how many developers are devoted to that product line. Uh, your, your vendor may be willing to share that information with you. You can also get some indications of this just from looking at what level of new features and functionality are being released and what's the frequency of those releases. If you're noticing over time that the, the frequency and the content of those uh, releases is declining, then I think you can, you can get a pretty good sense that perhaps your publisher is not investing as heavily in that solution. And that should be a red flag for you about the long-term viability of your product. You wanna make sure that you are on a supported application uh, because business continuity, is, it's critical to have an application that you can recover if there are any uh, critical errors in that application. And so being on a supported version is really important uh, for business continuity planning. So keep those things in mind. Uh, how is your publisher investing in the product? I think the other thing to think about is your customer experience. So how are you able to interact with your customer on, on this platform? If you have uh, disjointed customer experiences, perhaps we're not delivering the kind of on-time results we'd like to, perhaps we're not being able to respond and address customer concerns, and have visibility to that information the way that we need to, all of those things can cause uh, challenges with those long-term customer relationships, which uh, can be adverse, can adversely impact your business. So it's, it's important to think about how your tools allow you or uh, prevent you from interacting with your customers. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, accessibility in our last discussion. Just a, a remote experience that's challenging for our users can be an issue, um, especially in this particular pandemic that we are experiencing right now. I think as we're all moving to more of a, a mobile workforce, it's important for us to have tools that allow us to do that well. Um, and typical legacy ERP applications have challenges there because they require third-party solutions to maintain security. They can have performance issues around those remote experiences. So those might be uh, some, some key reasons to consider another um, accounting application. Probably though, one of the, one, two of the biggest challenges that we hear, one is manual processes and the other is reporting. We're gonna talk about that in a minute. Uh, so if we are trying to address business process with human resources, right? If we have repetitive things that happen in our business on a daily basis and we can't automate those using our applications and we're having to plug holes with people, then that stifles our growth. So as we are trying to expand, as we bring in more customers, as we're trying to process more transactions, the only way to solve that in some of these legacy ERP systems is to add more people because there's the flexibility is not there to personalize the application, right? To support some of that automation. So think about what kind of business processes you are performing outside of the application in Excel or in homegrown access databases. These things all stifle growth because they are manual processes that require human intervention. 
We also find that a lot of folks that are on legacy ERP, ERP platforms um, are challenged because they spend a lot of their investment just maintaining the existing application, making sure that they're not having um, availability issues, reliability issues, performance issues, and addressing those and making sure that their infrastructure is current to support the platform, making sure the platform is up and available to users at all times, as opposed to improving business processes, uh, defining new ways to do things, connecting better with customers and vendors. Those are innovative solutions and typical legacy ERP applications might not be able to support them. And finally, um, we, we so frequently hear, you know, we're putting data into the system, but we're having difficulty getting that data out. And it's because legacy ERP, ERP platforms typically rely on standard reports and system queries to get data out of the application. They're really not providing any actionable intelligence to the users. And it's forcing us to pull information together from a number of disparate systems to make intelligent decisions. So the more real time we can gain access to those dashboards and things like predictive analytics, the better we can make decisions about our business. So these are all things I think to think about when you're looking at a, an individual system and whether or not it's time to make a change. Now there's a lot of misconceptions about uh, what cloud really means. And I, I, may, I shouldn't probably call them misconceptions. They're just different definitions of cloud and they're well-established definitions of cloud. Um, one of which is I, folks that feel cloud means I just have my ERP application or my, other, my uh, system applications housed outside of my four walls on someone else's server. And that's commonly called a private cloud. It is definitely one, one uh, flavor of cloud. Uh, and, but what we typically find is there are other definitions of cloud that we're gonna talk about in a little bit to, to explain really what some of those differentiators are. Now with traditional on-premise software, what we typically find is it is roughly five times more expensive per license to maintain than a cloud ERP application is. Now, what, you, what you'll also find is the, the cost structure is different between these applications. So it can be difficult to understand your total cost of ownership of a, uh, an on-premise ERP application. So oftentimes we're not taking into account all of the costs that are involved in maintaining those solutions. But in general, statistics have found that uh, it's about five times more expensive per license just to maintain a legacy on-premise application. In addition to that, over 66% of the people that are using those types of applications find themselves version locked. And that's because customization was traditionally more difficult in these platforms. And it involved modifications sometimes to the core code base of the application. And then when you attempted to upgrade, it created problems with the application's integrity. So what happened is those customers had a functioning system and they just chose not to upgrade it as new features and functionality became available and therefore they couldn't really grow and expand with that solution. And we still, we find that to be the case many times with applications that they do have some level of customization toolkit, but that customization toolkit essentially involves modifying the underlying database structure of the basic application or modifying the code base of the solution. We also find that it drains innovation. So typically an on-premise environment, 91% or 90% of the, of the uh, company's IT budget is related just to maintenance of the solution as opposed to building new functionality on top of the platform and helping to grow the business. And finally, these legacy ERP, ERP applications were designed for a specific purpose. You can think of them as kind of point solutions. And therefore, if you were trying to solve an overall business problem, for example, have CRM and ERP and HR and e-commerce all combined in the same platform, it wasn't available to you under these solutions. They were very much designed for a specific purpose and you had more of a best of breed model, which created somewhat of an integration nightmare. You had to find some way to tie these solutions together or what happened is you, you ultimately uh, have the situation where you have unreliable data. You can run something out of your CRM system, but the sales and CRM don't match the sales and accounting, right? Because we have two different versions of the truth. Some of the 
on-premise software costs that you might want to consider as you're looking at your total cost of ownership could include the initial software purchase, which is typically a one-time fee, usually on an ongoing basis, they'll have some type of a, an annual maintenance fee to that. Some of these vendors have gone to more of a subscription license. Uh, so you are paying a yearly fee, but it looks more like a maintenance fee as opposed to the, the uh, full purchase of the software on an annual basis. Um, there's an implementation cost initially with the application. And then you as a user, sometimes even if you host this application on someone else's server, are responsible for fixes, upgrades, and for um, you know, maintaining any uh, version control within the application. You're responsible for managing your downtime and making sure that uh, you're addressing any issues that would cause availability problems within your environment. You're doing all of your own performance tuning. You're handling all of your own customizations, integrations, or leveraging a third party to do that. You're also typically responsible for backups and disaster recovery. And then you have to maintain all the infrastructure that's required to support these applications, which are typically um, very dependent on a specific technology, right? You may have a SQL-based system where you have to have a Microsoft stack installed. Many of them require specific versions of Windows and have a footprint on the, on the workstation. So there are a lot of these costs that you might not think are specifically related to your software, but really do uh, play into that overall total cost of ownership. Now, when we talked about the definition of cloud, we talked about, uh, is it just something that's hosted on another server? What does cloud really mean? And there are a lot of different definitions of this. Um, what, what we like to say is modern cloud ERP, one of the benefits of that is providing economies of scale. And you can get some level of economies of scale just by outsourcing the infrastructure component of your technology solution. So I'm gonna take my application, I'm gonna host it in another environment and those folks are gonna respons be responsible for maintaining the hardware, for making sure my, my system is backed up and I have disaster recovery plans in place. And so I'm gonna outsource a little bit of that functionality. But the reality is that ERP vendors cannot provide you true economies of scale without being something called multi-tenant. Okay, and multi-tenancy is not just about housing your data in someone else's infrastructure. It is about sharing the entire code base of the application with a group of tenants within that platform. So not only are we having a shared server and a shared database, but we have a shared underlying code base. And what that lets us do from an economies of scale perspective is now the publisher of that application who is also hosting it for you can upgrade all users simultaneously. Right? And so that's how they provide economies of scale because they don't have to upgrade each individual user and you're not responsible for your own upgrades anymore. So that's one concept of, of multi-tenancy. It also allows you to have growth without additional investment. So if I increase my users, I don't have to go out and buy a new server to support that additional volume or increase my licensing with Microsoft to do that, for example. I can simply procure additional users from my software vendor and they will take care of all of the underlying hardware and application requirements. What that lets me do is take all of the burden of maintaining that infrastructure and that code base off of my IT department. And I can uh, essentially outsource that to the publisher who is primary role is publishing world-class software and I can focus on innovation and growth, right? And what I need to do to manage my business. So there's a lot of other um, unique criteria associated with modern cloud ERP, but one of the things related to multi-tenancy is the concept of being versionless. So we talked about legacy ERP causing people to be version locked. Modern cloud ERP is versionless because you are always on the current version of software. What that means is you can take advantage right, of any of the new features and functionality immediately that's being offered by that software vendor. And all of that is delivered to you from the publisher, generally with less than 20 minutes of downtime on a semi-annual basis. Okay? And you don't have to do anything or hire anyone or maintain any salaries to accomplish that. So it is a huge benefit of a multi-tenant environment and a modern cloud ERP system. In addition to that, we talked a bit about fragmented environments where we have um, maybe point solutions that are tied together. The concept of a modern cloud ERP is really a unified database, a unified system to run your business. And so modern 
cloud ERP systems have now built in all of the components that are necessary to manage a growing business. And that could include your customer facing activities like CRM, marketing automation, customer service. It can include your e-commerce activities like a plug and play B2B and B2C website built out of the box. It can include all the HCM functionality of payroll and HR and all of the functionality of ERP for very diverse business types, including manufacturing distribution service, um, core accounting retail whatever your specific industry is. So with all of that housed in a single unified database, we now have one version of the truth, right? One view into profitability and customer relationship management and a full, what we call omni-channel customer experience, meaning regardless of how our customer wants to interact with us, we have one view of that customer across the organization, whether they come in over our B2B website, come in via phone, they, they ping us um, through our, our web platforms, uh, they call us on the phone. Everyone has the same visibility to that customer data. It's not isolated in uh, silos. In addition to that, uh, modern ERP applications are platform-based rather than feature function-based. And this is a big difference, uh, in my opinion. This is a huge, huge differentiator and benefit to, uh, to modern businesses. And what this means is, uh, it rather than delivering you a set of functionality, and, and essentially locking you into the functionality that's delivered by the ERP vendor with some very minor uh, customization tools available to you. They, de they developed an integrated development environment, which is a set of tools and a platform on which the ERP system was built. And then they deliver that platform to you with the ERP application. And that can sound fairly techni technical, right? It sounds like, oh my gosh, in order to run these, I need to have uh, you know, an entire development organization. What they've also provided to you within this integrated development environment is a user interface to manage all of those personalizations. So you can do all of these customizations without necessarily having to have development expertise in-house. They are, they are designed for power users and not developers. Okay, so think of the flexibility of that over a solution that has delivered you an out-of-the-box set of functionality versus a solution that is delivering to you a platform in which they develop their ERP functionality and giving you the flexibility to expand right, on those capabilities and to personalize that. And these things can include the ability to create user-defined tables, user-defined fields, customizable screens, uh, various report writers, uh, workflow engines that allow you to automate business processes. So a combination of those things all delivered with a, uh, a user interface. In addition to that, modern cloud ERP is of course mobile. Because it is cloud-based, any device that has access to a browser can access the application. Whereas legacy ERP may require a specific footprint on a workstation and it has to have an operating system that's compatible. That is not the case with modern cloud ERP. It's typically um, operating system agnostic, device agnostic, and browser agnostic. So it doesn't matter whether you're on an iPad and an iPhone or an Android or a Microsoft Surface tablet. It makes no difference what operating system you're running. As long as you have Chrome or Safari or uh, Edge, any browser will work. What that does is enables collaboration, right? Because now our customers, our vendors, they all have access to those same tools and we can now extend the functionality of our application to interact with them, right? And to increase our, our visibility into our supply chain and our connectivity with our customers. And finally, uh, Another benefit of modern cloud ERP is uh, insightful reporting. So real-time business intelligence. Legacy ERP, you often had to have a separate visualization tool. You had to synchronize with that tool into some type of a data lake or data warehouse, um, especially in order to combine data from disparate applications. Many of these tools now come with, I would call it insightful real-time reporting. So dashboards, KPIs, and KPI stands for Key Performance Indicator and that can be specific to your business or your industry. Uh, they'll typically come with libraries of those that are personalized to the, the industry that you function in. They will provide you operational and financial trend reporting combined into a single UI, and then forecasting capabilities for predictive intelligence, right, or predictive analytics. 
So not only are we looking at what has happened, but the system is helping us interpret what perhaps will happen, right? Based upon historical trends. So we talked about some of the costs of a legacy ERP system. Modern ERP cloud costs look very different, right? Because we're essentially outsourcing all of the complexity of managing an ERP application. And we've boiled this down to a subscription, the initial implementation, and then any, any personalizations we wanna do on top of those, right? And that's our responsibility to maintain going forward. So when you're comparing on-premise versus cloud, this, this is the kind of the iceberg model, the difference is beneath the surface. With uh, legacy ERP, licensing is a small portion of the overall cost. But beneath the surface, you're going to have all of the infrastructure costs, the maintenance costs, the upgrade costs, any patches or bug fixes that need to be done. You're going to have IT resources that need to be devoted to the product, um, ongoing training, perhaps uh, internal resources needed for that. Whereas uh, from a cloud perspective, most of your costs are visible and above the surface because they are built into what's called the subscription license. And keep in mind that subscription license incorporates all of the infrastructure costs, all the ongoing maintenance costs of the application. It includes all of the upgrades. So the licensing becomes really more than just uh, a license to operate the software. It is also a managed service around that. And then in addition to that, you may have consulting from an external firm to help you uh, optimize your use of the product. You're certainly gonna have training. Oftentimes that's included in the licensing and available to you at no additional charge directly from the publisher in on-demand training. And then you may also have, have redeploy your IT resources from a maintenance function to an innovation function, which is gonna be beneficial to the overall organization. So what does this mean? And if we boil it down to what direction is the industry going? The reality is the market has built their last on-prem ERP application because customers have chosen cloud and they will continue to choose cloud going forward because it is the better technology that provides more flexibility to grow the business. So I think you have to be careful um, today about investing in something that is not true multi-tenant cloud. If it is a traditional on-premise ERP system that's simply been hosted in the cloud, you should have some concerns about that because investment in those kinds of solutions is going to plummet over the next several years. Um, it's very, very expensive for these ERP vendors to retrofit or rebuild their applications for the cloud. And so in many cases, they're not willing to do that. What they'd rather do is go out and buy an application that was built for the cloud, right? And we see that commonly, folks like Sage, um, rather than retrofit their traditional ERP solutions to the cloud, they went out and bought a solution called Intact so they could have a cloud offering. And guess what? Their investment is going towards their cloud offerings and not their, their legacy ERP. So that's just one example. Uh, Microsoft is another example. You could look at a number of different publishers out there in the same scenario. Um, but ultimately, the global cloud ERP solutions market through 2023 uh, is going to experience significant growth. And that's really the direction the industry is going. So as you're evaluating solutions, that's something you really want to consider. Make sure you're on the right technology that's going to be supported long term. So the next topic here is what are the eight dangers of legacy technology? So what are the challenges people that are using legacy technology have, um, particularly around business growth? And we talked about some of these before. So the first one here is draining innovation for your IT budget. So we're spending the money, right? We have resources there committed to maintaining these products, but we're not investing in growing the business. We're investing in maintaining the status quo. And that's a, a real challenge for legacy ERP applications. They are expensive to maintain. An example here is a customer that was uh, spending 3% of their revenue just maintaining uh, SAP. Moving to a cloud ERP application reduced that cost to 0.1% of their revenue. Uh, another issue here is that uh, sometimes changes that drive our business are coming from outside of our four walls and our, our organization. This could be competitive pressures, right? It could be, in this case, business regulations. 
right? It could be expansion into new geographies requiring compliance with other um, accounting regulations and rules and specific reporting requirements around that. So when we have that scenario, uh, point solutions that were designed for generally a specific geography can struggle to keep up with these kinds of regulatory and legislative changes that are required. Um, a good example is ASC 606, which is the revenue recognition rules that went into place uh, for various businesses in the last few years. ASC 842 is another good example. Um, ASC 606 is about revenue recognition and it had an impact on a number of different businesses and industries. ASC 842 is some new leasing requirements and legacy ERP applications who are not investing in their solutions have trouble uh, developing the functionality that supports these new requirements, right? They also have trouble developing the functionality to support additional uh, geographies as we might wanna expand into let's say Canada or Europe. And now we're subject to IFRS or now we're subject to um, other regulatory issues that need to be addressed. Um, it, we're not going to have that flexibility, right? With a legacy based uh, accounting system. It's also a drag on business velocity. So as we try to grow and expand, typical legacy systems, when we try to add an additional company, let's say we've acquired someone or we're opening up a new subsidiary and a new geography, that involves essentially taking a footprint or a copy of our existing company code and deploying it in another database within that same environment, right, in many cases. And that can be costly and time consuming. It's, and you're maintaining then two sets of everything, two charts of accounts, two customer records, two vendor records, two item master files. Um, so it can be difficult to deploy um, in, in those environments. In a modern cloud ERP, you may find that based upon the subsidiary structure and the architecture of the underlying solution, you can spin up a new subsidiary in under a half an hour and have it completely set up and ready to function. Right, so uh, just the flexibility of those of, of the modern ERP solutions is really a, a benefit. Mobile, we've spent a lot of time talking about mobile uh, in this presentation, but an example of a traditional architecture might involve you know, a, a database interacting with an application layer and then a third party VPN solution to allow you to connect to those databases externally and from mobile devices, typically requiring a lot of IT resources and third party solutions to support that. Whereas a true cloud solution, any, your data anywhere, anytime, any device, any browser, completely out of the box. Centralized um, legacy ERP can hamper a, a decentralized business. So when we have people that need to collaborate from a number of different locations, right? Globally or within the US, uh, just having a legacy ERP application that has performance issues and connectivity issues um, is, is challenging, right? And it doesn't allow for the kind of collaboration that we might need with our employees and other folks within our organization. And it typically fails to satisfy the appetite for real-time data. Again, rather than having a dashboard-driven uh, environment, we have a scenario where we have to print reports to get data out of the application or we have to design queries and extract them to Excel and manipulate that data in Excel to present that in a format that's meaningful for our users. Modern ERP applications offer those tools out of the box and they let you design your own pivot tables, charts, trend graphs, KPIs, uh, comparative analysis tools, reminders, workflows, all of those things that you need to really have actionable intelligence about your business are built out of the box. Legacy ERP typically walls your business off from your suppliers and your customers because it's not an open platform that those folks can interact with, with tools that exist in their environment. We talked about this, but most uh, ERP systems, modern cloud ERP systems will have portals that are of course web-based and that allow our vendors 
to interact directly with us on purchasing, our customers to interact directly with us on support issues, uh, open invoices, pay bills online, reprint invoices from history, uh, review their statements, place orders, enter quotes, ask questions. All of these things can be done without an uh, e-commerce e presence um, and just directly with the customer through a portal. So it allows you to extend the application within your enterprise and beyond. Now this doesn't just apply to customers and vendors, but it can also apply to employees, right? Allowing them to collaborate and interact with the application in a self-service model from a payroll perspective, uh, again, is a, is a uh, limitation of a legacy ERP application. All right, so what are some of the benefits of a cloud of cloud software for a growing business? We've talked briefly about this, but I really wanna stress the differentiator that modern ERP systems are built as unified platforms. They are not built as point solutions. Um, and, and although they, you, they still support, right? Integration with external environments, they often, often uh, offer SOAP and REST-based APIs so you can connect to any other systems that you may choose to. Um, they really are designed to holistically support the business. And so you'll see everything from uh, B2B and B2C e-commerce platforms available plug and play within the ERP environment. You will see a full CRM solution. So you can typically handle things like Salesforce automation, customer service and marketing automation off of a single customer prospect or lead record. They will handle all of the traditional ERP functionality from core accounting to distribution, to manufacturing, to service, to retail, to, uh, to software. And they will incorporate uh, a, an HCM functionality, which is human capital management. And that typically in includes both payroll and HR should you choose to bring those in-house, all centralized in a single database within a single user interface. So you have one version of the truth. The other benefit, another benefit of modern ERP uh, applications is scalability. So just by being in the cloud, you can have, you can grow from one to a thousand users without having to do anything with your infrastructure. Right? No additional licensing required outside of the users that you purchase through your ERP application. They take care of all of the database and the operating system licensing that's required. You can also scale these up or scale them down, right? Because you're going to pay for this on a subscription basis. If you want to remove modules, you can remove those from your subscription license. If you want to add or remove users, you can do that at any point in your process. And so you are not locked into that initial perpetual license that you purchased. It also typically is delivered under a modular structure, which allows you to scale out functionality in addition to users. So you could essentially add on advanced manufacturing to your light manufacturing environment and add additional features and functionality without uh, too much cost and effort to do so. It also allows for rapid deployment of company specific solutions. Meaning that anything that I want to, to do to personalize my own environment, to extend the functionality, to add automation, I am doing that in my own layer within, within the code base. And I'm utilizing the integrated development environment and those um, user interface tools to do it. And that's going to be maintained as separate from the code base so that it survives every update process. That's what makes this so scalable and flexible you will not get into a version lock situation based upon the architecture of these applications. It also helps us reduce risk, right? So all of the disaster recovery is now outsourced to the, uh, uh, the publisher of the application and they can invest more in the infrastructure than you as an individual company ever could. In fact, in most cases, uh, these environments are being simultaneously replicated in two different areas of the country instantaneously as you're processing transaction. That gives you complete failover capability should anything happen, let's say an earthquake in California um, and your, your data is stored there, it's been failed over into Chicago. So you can instantly recover and continue processing even if something happens to your primary data center. 
Okay, these are the kinds of things that we as individual companies can't really afford to do, right? We're used to just taking backups and then we'd have to restore from that backup. This is a much more sophisticated risk management uh, device for you. They're also responsible for compliance with all regulations. So they're making sure that your application is PCI compliant. You're not responsible for making sure that your environment is, is uh, compatible with those regulations. GDPR, if you're dealing with customers in the EU, uh, those things are, are critical to have compliance with those regulations. <clears throat> It also ensures your data security, your system reliability, and uptimes in general in these types of applications are pushing five nines. And what that means is 99.999% uptime. They'll generally uh, contractually guarantee you 99.95% uptime in their, in their applications, but they're typically pushing all five nines. High availability. So again, real-time access anywhere, anytime, any device. These are all completely cloud-based, browser and device agnostic, and you can get to that data however you want to. They also have apps that can be loaded on your, your smaller mobile devices that will reconfigure the screen so that they're optimized for those, uh, for those environments. And those are all free of charge. A typically enable visibility to business intelligence and transactional data across multiple geographies, languages, and legislations. So these are truly global applications, right? You will not be constrained to a single geography by investing in a typical modern cloud ERP application. They're not dependent on hardware specifications, right? There's never what they call a footprint on the workstation, meaning you don't have to install anything because all we need is a browser. Right? And your performance is only dependent on the speed of your internet connection. Right? You're being optimized for the number of uh, volume of transactions and for the number of users you have on that publisher server. And all you have to ensure is that you have an adequate internet connection. So final topic here is how to identify and evaluate the right technology for your needs. So if you've decided it's time to look, what are some of the criteria you should consider as you're evaluating these applications? I like to call these the five Ps, and we're gonna go through uh, five different criteria that you should consider and kind of the relative importance of each one. Uh, the first P is price. Uh, price is always relevant. Everyone has a budget. Um, there's not one size fits all necessarily in this, um, in, in ER the ERP space. You should understand how the pricing is structured. Is it per module, per user, some combination thereof? Is it subscription-based product or an ownership model? Uh, are there any upgrade fees involved? Modern ERP, there typically won't be. Are there any hidden costs that you're not aware of? How, like, for example, what about training? Is training included or I need to pay extra for, for access to your training tool? What's the total top cost of ownership over a five-year uh, five year lifespan of the application? And what are the tangible ways that I can calculate the return on investment? For this solution. So these are all things to think about. But what I would tell you is price is probably the least important component of this equation because as long as you are looking at products that are in the same class, right, products that typically compete against each other, this price is fairly negotiable with your vendor. So um, you know, this is something that we help customers with all the time is negotiating with these with these software vendors to get the best possible price. Uh, the reality is they are going to be competitive with other products in their class at the end of the day. So you may see initially a large variance in list price, but at the end of the day, they want this to be a win-win for both organizations and they will work with you on price. So I typically tell people, initially take price out of the equation and identify the solution that you wanna purchase on the other four criteria, and then work with the selected vendor on price to see if you can get within your budget and, and create a win-win situation because Generally, I found that you can. The next thing that people typically focus on is what I call product. So the second P would be product. And this really relates to functionality. And everybody spends the bulk of their effort in an evaluation process on functionality. But the reality is, if you are, again, in the right class of product, you're likely to find a 90% match regardless of product. Right? These, there's, there, the functionality of these things is all very comparable with some subtle differences. Okay, there's not you know, a clear winner necessarily in any industry. 
Uh, but you, what you do want to know is, does it support your core functional needs? And some things to look at here is, are any of my peers using this software? Any of the other companies in my industry? How many referenceable clients does, the, does that publisher have in my space? Right? Is it designed for my industry or does it have a version of the software that has been tailored to my specific industry with any unique functionality? That could be, could be relevant. Does it have critical mass in the marketplace? How many people are using this solution? Right? Is something to consider. Is there a robust ISV community and that stands for independent software vendor supporting the solution? So how mature is it? You don't necessarily want to be on the bleeding edge of these things because you don't know if the software publisher is going to ultimately be able to invest enough and get enough traction in the market to be able to continue to develop that solution. So it's really good to look at established products in the marketplace that are designed for your industry, have critical mass in your space and referenceable customers. And generally, you're going to be able to find a 90% fit. No system is going to be 100% exactly what you need, right? But but that's the benefit of having a platform because then you have that 90% fit and then you can essentially extend the functionality to support that additional 10% of what I call your secret sauce or what makes you different. Now we've talked a bit about platform. I do think it's important to understand the technology stack that is underneath whatever application you're looking at. So learn what it is built on and make sure that technology is relevant. Because in many cases, the reason ERP systems die is because the underlying technology they were built on has been discontinued. And there's numerous examples of that throughout uh, you know, recent, recent uh, years. Does it have a, a solution that allows for APIs, that stands for application program interfaces, or the ability to connect, essentially exposing the business objects to external environments via SOAP or REST? Do I have that flexibility? Because you don't know what you might need to connect with in the future. Uh, can you enhance the native functionality, right? What tools have they given you in that platform and how easy are they to use? What skill sets do you need to have to support that personalization? You don't wanna have to hire five developers, right? Just to, just to build out the application. How reliable is it? Do they have uptime guarantees? Also, it is important to look at the publisher. We talked briefly about this at the beginning of the presentation, but how invested is the publisher in this particular application? In many cases, your publisher uh, may actually, the publisher you're looking at may actually have four to five to 10 solutions in the marketplace, all competing for the same customer, right? And so then the, the challenge that they have is where do they place their investment? So it's it's, important to select a publisher that you know is going to continue to invest in your solution. And the safest way to do that is to find a publisher that doesn't support multiple platforms in the same market space, right? They don't have 10 distribution solutions trying to go after the mid-market. They have one because you know where the investment's going. What levels of growth is this publisher experiencing? for this product? How many new licenses are they selling on a quarterly, semi-annual and annual basis? Right, that's important to understand. Do they have competing products? What resources from the publisher are available to me? And this could involve, am I going to get a customer um, relationship resource that's gonna work with me on, on upgrades or optimizations that I want? Uh, am I going to get training, access to training? What are the tools that they're going to enable me with? What kind of support is included direct uh, from the publisher? Those are all questions to ask to determine whether or not the publisher is right for your business. I also like to find out how many developers are currently devoted to this application because that will tell you a lot about the continued investment in the product. But I think the most important thing to consider is who's the partner that I'm going to use to implement this. Um, because ultimately this is a long-term relationship with whatever uh, partner you choose. And you wanna make sure that someone that you're compatible with, that you are, have comfort in their methodology, that you feel can help you, that understands your industry, right? And can continue to support your growth. So ask your partner if they have vertical specific uh, knowledge in your industry. Do they have referenceable clients that you can talk to that are similar to you? Do they have a proven implementation methodology to set you up for success? And many, many folks will tell you they have a proven methodology. What I would ask for is some relevant examples 
For example, you may want to see the artifacts that they use in that uh, implementation methodology. If they are well established and do have a proven methodology, they will be able to share with you sample project plans and risk management plans and training plans and test scripts that are available and data conversion templates and all the tools that you'll need to really be successful. Um, they'll also oftentimes provide you portals to be able to access and collaborate on your uh, implementation plan as you're going through the process. So then what resources do they have to provide you after the implementation? How are you going to continue that relationship? Be sure you talk about those uh, tools as well. And then it's always good if they can provide biographies of their resources with relevant experience in your industry. So all those are, are things that should be evaluated as you are considering a new ERP application. Okay, I think that is the tail end of our presentation. So um, I would take some questions now. Okay, so it says, um, do I, did I miss something? What is publisher? <laughs> okay, no, great question. Thank you. I did not describe that. So the publisher is whoever has actually um, developed the application and is selling it to you under a subscription license. So these folks are generally like Microsoft or Intact or Oracle or SAP, and they're in the business of producing world-class software. And so they're, they're de developing it and licensing it to you, and that is the publisher. All right, um, I'm gonna take control away real quick. If you would, Amy, down on your menu bar, there is a Q&A box icon. Yeah. This next question is kind of lengthy, so it okay. be easier just to read. <laughs> right. How do the big ERP software companies handle it when, if the internet goes down for an extended period of time? Is there a way to keep a local copy that's synchronized with the web version in case of a long-term disruption of the internet? Uh, generally, no. Um, generally, these cloud-based applications are going to depend, be dependent on a reliable ERP or a reliable internet connection in your geography. Now, this is typically up to your ISP or your internet service provider, and usually they have built what's called redundancy into their network. So, I'll give you an example. I'm located in Nebraska. It used to be 15 years ago that from an internet perspective, we had one line that ran down our interstate I-80, which goes east-west across Nebraska. And we have a lot of farmers in the state. And if a farmer would cut that wire, cut that line accidentally in some digging process, you could have Western Nebraska out of internet for a day or so. But ultimately the ISPs recognized the failure in that structure and uh, governments invested in redundancy in the internet environment. So what happens now is this failover capability that when a wire is cut in, in one direction that might impact um, uh, the internet in some way, shape or form, the, the redundant connections available in the internet will, will restore that availability instantaneously. So it's, it's unique, and I don't know that I've heard of a long-term internet out, outage. What you are more likely to have is a software outage due to some infrastructure issue in their particular data center. And that could cause probably a longer-term issue than um, internet access in general. Because if you think about it, let's just say something does happen to your wired connection in your office. You could hotspot your phone, get a cell signal to the internet, and have access to your ERP application or go next door and have access to your internet application. So it would be a very unique situation if the internet completely went down in geography for an extended period of time due to the redundancy we have. It's more likely to be a hardware failure in a, in a, uh, a data center. I would, in which case they have failover capabilities for that too within their disaster recovery plan. Awesome, thanks Amy. There's just two small questions here. So what is SMB acronym? Is it small and medium business? It is small to medium sized yeah. business. Sorry, did I say that without defining? I apologize. No worries. All right. Well, that is all the questions in here. Okay. Well, I thank everybody for, att for attending. I think we made it the full hour. So we'll be able to issue some CPE.